Hi, this is a presentation on the ultrasound diagnosis of caesarean scar defects. My name is Suzanne Johnson and I'm a gynaecologist from Southampton. The definition of a caesarean scar defect, which is also called a niche or isthmocele, is an indentation at the site of the section scar with a depth of at least 2 mm. A niche can cause symptoms like postmenstrual spotting, dysmenorrhea, chronic pelvic pain, subfertility, obstetric complications in a future pregnancy, and it's a risk factor for caesarean scar ectopic pregnancy. If there are symptoms resulting from a niche, this is called a caesarean scar disorder. The scar disorders are becoming more common because caesarean sections are becoming more common. Some countries now have section rates of 80%, um, and in the UK it's about 21%, but it's going to go up to 1 in 3 of all childbirths by the end of the decade. A lot of these section scars don't heal properly, so that between 42 and 84% form a niche uh, in the lower part of the uterus. So what does a normal section scar look like on ultrasound? This is a longitudinal view of the uterus. There's one section scar and there's another. This patient, you can see, has had three caesarean section scars. This is a little video clip of two caesarean section scars. You can see one is there and one is there, and the internal os of the cervix is just about there. So when you are looking for a scar or a niche, it depends where to look for an antiverted and a retroverted uterus. This uterus is antiverted, the uterine fundus pointing toward the bladder, and you can see that the uh, caesarean scar and the niche indeed is uh, there in the anterior uterine wall. In a retroverted uterus, the uterine fundus is pointing toward the patient's feet, but of course the section is still in the anterior uterine wall. So sometimes you get problems with wound healing. Uh, this patient had a 35 millimeter caesarean section hematoma, uh, and sometimes these heal uh, as fibrous tissue, and in this case it was uh, really became very small. Um, this uh, patient ended up with a, a small seroma at the site of her section scar, just there. This patient had an infected hematoma, and you can see air and you can see suture material. Um, and this is what that looked like. It's clearly in the site of the caesarean section. There's some suture material and brightly echogenic air. So there's an abscess. And whether or not the wound heals nicely, you often get bladder adhesion stuck to the caesarean section scar. This patient developed a large niche after she had an elective section for a breach presentation at 39 weeks. Uh, and you can see easily that there's a, a big gap there uh, in the longitudinal and in the transverse planes. Um, the, there are a lot of papers now telling us how to measure the niche. And the essential measurements are the length, depth and width of the niche with residual and adjacent myometrial thickness measurements. You can take other measurements as well, um, but these are, are not so common to, to do at the moment. In this paper, they suggested that gel or saline is preferred over a standard transvaginal ultrasound because you may not see the niche if it doesn't have fluid in it. But it's not mandatory if there is some intrauterine fluid and fluid in the niche. Uh, the niche can be subclassified as simple or simple with a branch or complex with more than one branch. So these papers show us how to measure the niche and the length, which is the largest uh, and at the base of a niche, the depth, and I'll show you all this in ultrasound images in a moment, and then the width. The most important measurements are the uh, residual myometrial thickness and the adjacent myometrial thickness. So how to measure a niche? Uh, in this case, this patient has a, a fluid-filled niche at the site of her previous section scar, and you can see in the longitudinal plane, I'm just passing through it, and now I'm going to take some measurements. So this is the, the length, this is the depth, and in the transverse plane, this is the width of the niche. And then the little bit of overlying myometrium over the top, you don't include the fibrous tissue that's adjacent, but just myometrium, it can be almost invisible. You measure that, that's the residual myometrial thickness. And then next to that is the adjacent myometrial thickness. That's how thick that this, this area should be. And the, um, the, the, the residual and the adjacent gives you a good idea of how thin and how large this niche is.
You can do 3D on a niche as well. It's not super helpful, but it you can see the niche here in the longitudinal plane um, and longitudinal and in the transverse. And I would say in the transverse plane, it's quite useful for showing you the, the extent of the niche uh, laterally. And large niches can cause spotting, of course, because uh, in this niche, and you can see here, there's the niche. It's almost impossible to see any myometrium uh, overlying it. Uh, and you can see that there's some menstrual fluid and clot, and it's literally just sloshing in and out of this niche. The fluid can collect here and then trickle out over the, the next few days after the period has actually finished. And you can also easily imagine how having this kind of fluid hanging around might uh, reduce embryo implantation in the endometrial cavity. And there's a 3D image of this case where again you can see this tremendous bulging anteriorly. So once somebody uh, gets pregnant who's had a cesarean section, uh, what does that look like? So there is the section scar. You can see here's the internal cervical os. The external os would be about there. And then there's a nice little bit of distance before the pregnancy. There's a pregnancy there. So the pregnancy is nowhere near the scar. That's normal. But sometimes the pregnancy implants in the scar, and that's called the cesarean scar pregnancy, um, where the pregnancy is implanted into the defect, of course, by dehiscence or non-healing of the, the section scar. Um, it's a non-tubal ectopic pregnancy. It can be life-threatening. Um, and the trophoblast grows into the myometrium and to the tissues beyond. The reported prevalence is about 1 in 2,000 pregnancies, and it's going up. Um, but women with a scar ectopic often present early in pregnancy with vaginal bleeding and pelvic pain. Um, but it's often then misdiagnosed. This is the best time to diagnose these pregnancies, but it's often not recognized in early pregnancy. And that's why the prevalence is probably underestimated. Two out of three of these scar pregnancies will fail before 10 weeks. So transvaginal ultrasound is the optimal method for diagnosing scars in the first trimester with a very high sensitivity. An MRI doesn't help you at this stage in the pregnancy. And you can tell the difference on transvaginal ultrasound between a scar ectopic, a cervical pregnancy uh, and a, a miscarriage. But there are no agreed reference standards for the diagnosis of scar pregnancy. And no classification system has been validated yet. So in this paper, uh, the rules are that you have an empty uterine cavity and cervical canal, that the gestation sac is in close contact with, uh, with a section scar with a bit of pressure. There's no sliding, so it shows it's implanted. There may or may not be cardiac activity. The, we've talked about the residual myometrial thickness and the adjacent myometrial thickness in niches. It's just the same in a scar pregnancy. You must put color Doppler on to, to prove that the trophoblast has implanted there. Um, and you can uh, decide where the pregnancy is in relation to the endometrial cavity, the myometrium and the serosa. So in the first trimester ultrasound, the pregnancy is implanted into a niche. And at this point, you can't really see the niche, but you know that uh, it must be there. There's an absence of uh, or very thin myometrium. Um, we do uh, the ultrasound with a partially full bladder. It really helps uh, to, to look at this area a, a bit better. And with a bit of experience, you'll be able to recognize these. Diagnosing these scar pregnancies is much harder after about seven or eight weeks gestation because the pregnancy will then start to fill the uterine cavity. So it becomes much more difficult. And so where is it in an antiverted uterus, just like the section scar, it's there, close to the bladder, in the anterior uterine wall. Um, and then you can see just there, the antiverted uterus, it's pointing toward the bladder. And you can see that the scar pregnancy is located very low. And then in a retroverted uterus, the, you, you can see that the uterine fundus is pointing toward the patient's feet. But again, in the anterior uterine wall, just above the internal os, you've got a scar pregnancy. The first thing you might see is a little triangular sac. That it might be the first thing that strikes you. You'll only see that in less than eight weeks gestation. So what do we need to see? An empty uterine cavity, especially at less than eight weeks gestation. Um, we need an empty endocervical canal with a closed cervix. The placenta or gestation sac is embedded at the site of the scar with a negative sliding sign. So when you very gently press with the probe, this doesn't move. A very thin or absent myometrium between the sac and the bladder. Uh, 
functional trophoblastic circulation on color Doppler. This is extremely important. You put your color Doppler on at 0.9 or 0.6 and you're looking for vascularity that shows that the trophoblast has implanted into the myometrium. So in, with an X-ray consensus, this uh, scar pregnancies were called ectopic uh, and they can be partial and complete. Most of them are partial where the gestation sac is implanted uh, and invading the myometrium, but it is also partly in the uterine cavity, whereas a complete scar pregnancy is entirely embedded within the scar and these are much more rare. Then there's type one, two or three. In type one, more than half of the gestation sac is in the uterine cavity. In type two, more than half the gestation sac is in the myometrium. And in type three, it's bulging. Uh, the scar pregnancy here crosses the serosal line. You can see that in this diagram from this paper. The differential diagnosis of a scar pregnancy is a miscarriage and a cervical pregnancy. This is a scar pregnancy where you can see that the scar pregnancy is embedded above the internal os. In this case, this is a miscarriage uh, passing through so that there'll be a positive sliding sign. When you press gently, this will move. And there's a negative Doppler because the trophoblast is not implanted, but the pregnancy is passing through. And then this is a cervical pregnancy where you can see this is the level of the internal os. If the pregnancy is below the level of the internal os, it's a cervical pregnancy. If it's above the internal os, it's a scar pregnancy. So again, showing you an example, in this case, we can see an upper endometrial cavity, which is empty and the cervix is empty. This patient was eight and a half weeks gestation. And you can see that the, the cervix there is empty and that there is strong vascularity, strong vascularity here with very thin overlying residual myometrial thickness. You can also look for the cord insertion. That's not from these papers, but it's something that I do. Um, even at this gestation, you can see the cord and you can see where it's pointing and that will be the trophoblast. And it's very useful to see if you can say whether the bladder is mobile or not. Um, I'm just looking from side to side in this video clip and then I'll press slightly and you can see that the bladder is relatively free. It's not being invaded by a trophoblast. So in this case, again, um, whether it's a type three scar pregnancy is really important. There's the serosal line. You can see that this scar pregnancy is really bulging anteriorly toward the bladder. Um, and on 3D, again, you can, you can see how clear that is. So you can do 3D and um, just uh, have a look to, to see what, the, um, what tissues are being involved, but it's not crucial. This patient had a cesarean hysterectomy at 39 weeks gestation and the histology was placenta percreta. So as a little video summary, an empty endometrial cavity, the gestation sac is embedded very low but above the level of the internal os. I would need to do color Doppler of course to prove it's actually embedded and not just uh, sitting there and then looking to see if the bladder is being invaded uh, and it is not. And there's my evidence. I like to split my screen so that I can see um, where I think the trophoblast is and then it proves it by this extremely strong vascularity. So when you have a very thin myometrium in the niche and there is deficient endometrium in this area and so the placenta will attach itself deeply into the myometrium and go for uh, large blood vessels nearby. Um, and when that happens, um, you develop an abnormally um, adherent placenta and it can be placenta accreta, increta or percreta. And this is a selection of some uh, cases that we had in my hospital, uh, 10 over 10 years, where the pregnancy was implanted in the niche. Uh, they were all diagnosed early. Uh, all 10, um, the babies were well delivered after 27 weeks, but eight of the 10 had a cesarean hysterectomy. The other two, uh, maybe should have as well. Some of these patients had excessive blood loss and in the eight that had a hysterectomy, they all had placenta accreta spectrum. And just choosing this one case showing you at six weeks gestation, seven weeks, nine weeks, you can see that the pregnancy is beginning to fill the cavity. At 14 weeks, very little residual myometrial thickness. 
the, the placentation you can see is going toward the bladder but actually not invading the bladder 29 weeks similarly uh, at hysterectomy you can see these huge vessels and a very deficient uh, section scar uh, she had a cesarean hysterectomy and um, placenta accreta uh, spectrum percreta in this case was diagnosed at histology so why is early diagnosis so important um, in this paper, 460 patients uh, were, uh, had a scar pregnancy in 30 centres and they had either surgical or medical treatment. More than 90% of them were managed effectively uh, with, with um, surgical treatment. But as the pregnancy continues, the effectiveness decreases. The complications of, uh, of these scar pregnancies, including the management, is severe hemorrhage, preterm labor, uterine rupture, and these plantation uh, disorders. But major hemorrhage can occur in all three trimesters and can lead to hysterectomy and to death. So in future, as this paper uh, describes very eloquently, always consider the possibility of a scar pregnancy in a patient with a previous caesarean section. Adopt a standardised sonographic approach to increase the diagnosis of these and refer to regional expert centres for confirmation. Thank you.